The first thing to start off with is a, is a very effective history. So the age of the patient does obviously mould your history because are you going to ask a 60 year old birth history? Probably not, but you might ask them about recent traumas and you might ask them about if they've you know, got some acquired double vision. Um, if they're very young, six months to eight months, maybe the first time you're seeing them, you'd want to ask how they were born, the history, if they were premature. And I think these things really start off by you know, questioning, but then actually moulding into your examination to come. So there's quite a few factors that you could use just to differentiate, just from taking a good enough history. So for example, if something had happened a week ago, someone would be able to tell you, this happened a week ago, and I now have an abnormal head posture, which is quite painful because my neck's hurting me, but I'm not seeing double anymore. Um, and they can tell you a specific time, a specific date, and they can tell you exactly what's happened, exactly what's hurting. A congenital deviation, they will know no different. That's all they know. So it's a really good differential because actually, eventually, you then learn that you're only really going to manage the the congenital deviations whereas, and just monitor them and see them, see how they go. Whereas the acquired ones, that's a big problem because actually you need to know what the etiology of it is, what's causing these problems to happen, what's caused it in the first place. And they might need some effective treatment straight away, so they might need to be referred directly, urgently. They might need just routine general health workup, but it's still good to know what's causing these factors. Congenital, less so. So uh, there's a few other things on the slide as well, like um, ideally things like amblyopia, you're probably going to find that in a congenital deviation because it's been there for such a t long time. If it's a manifest deviation, they're probably going to have some form of suppression or amblyopia. Muscle sequelae, so uh, probably a long time ago, many of us learned it at university, but actually it's good to know here that actually if it was an acquired deviation, you probably wouldn't get a lot of muscle sequelae where the contralateral muscle, if there's a primary underactor, is going to help just to compensate with this underaction that's happened and try and make these eyes a bit more equal, make the double vision go away. If you had a congenital problem, um, generally you find quite a few deviations that are congenital that have been there for some time, whether it be muscle related like a Duane's or a Brown syndrome, um, and actually the muscle is already affected. It's because it's been underdeveloped or fibrosed, and so it is what it is. You know, you're not going to have muscle sequelae like you would in a neurogenic palsy. You probably won't have the history as you would in a neurogenic palsy as well. So really with a congenital problem like a mechanical problem you'd probably note that they have an abnormal head posture just to try and help them um, they have extended fusion because they've had it for some time and they've overcome it and been able to extend their fusional ranges which is great for them um, they might actually have BSV because they have binocular vision in their primary gaze because they can control their eyes a little bit um, and they've overcome the deviation that they have which is very small in primary position because like I said it, it is what it is um, Observations will tell you a little bit as well, but they probably won't actually complain about an abnormal head posture if they've got a congenital problem. This is about the neurogenic and the mechanical palsies, really. Um, and again, it's just to, again, have in the back of your mind, is it something that's happened that I could do something about? Do I need urgent referral? Or is it just going to be something that I review and practice because it's been there for a very long time? So with the mechanical palsies, you find that obviously because it's a muscle problem, Generally, in primary position, it's quite a small deviation. You don't really see much. So, um, unless you start moving them into the positions where the deviation is active. In terms of a neurogenic palsy, you actually find that you can see just how big the palsy is in primary position. Ocular motility in a mechanical deviation is generally equal um, inductions and versions. And then, so when you're looking with one eye and two, um, and ocular motility is better on inductions than versions in a neurogenic palsy. If it's a mechanical deviation, again, it's a problem with the muscle, and that's it. So if it's a problem with the muscle, really, there's going to be potentially an aim to try and compensate for that problem. So maybe the first step of muscle sequelae will happen, but actually you find that in a neurogenic palsy, if you leave it for some time, the whole muscle sequelae actually happens, and eventually you actually find the patient is quite symmetrical on the head spots, and their history is, is much better when you see them after a few months. We find that actually if you take pressures in different positions of gaze, um, in a mechanical deviation, um, there's an increase in pressures when you're looking away from the limited position, and generally the pressures in a neurogenic palsy remain the same um, all the way around. So it's worth just potentially having a look at these differential diagnoses when you're doing these tests and just thinking about it. All optometrists were trained to be able to do a cover test. All optometrists were trained to be able to do a stereo test and all optometrists were trained to do motility and we can do it. We have two types of cover tests obviously. You've got the cover and cover, uh, looking for the manifest deviations and then you've got 
Um, the alternating cover test, again, looking for the latent phorias. Assessing the patient for you know, seeing if they've got a deviation, seeing if they've got um, certain problems like, for example, um, a motility problem with the actual muscle, um, that's really going to help your diagnosis. Looking at an ESO deviation going from in to out, um, you'd use a base out prism. And looking for an exo deviation going from out to in, again, you'd use a basin. Hyper, hypo, you've got the base down and the base up prism. And then there's this sort of hazy topic of decompensated Fourier's. We would need to know which direction the deviation is going in and how it's decompensated and obviously use the, the prism accordingly. So just moving on to the congenital sort of squints that we would see, the fully ocom and the partially ocoms. These are basically squints that have happened that can that they happen because of too much accommodation basically. And so what we would do is find the full refractive power. So generally a lot of plus, dispense that, and obviously find that the accommodative esos that are fully, um, because of that reason, would relax and become either esophorias or orthophoric. And the partial ecoms, there's still a little bit of eso left, even after the refractive error has been put in place. Uh, convergence exos, uh, they, these happen mainly at NIA. Um, so again, they can be relaxed and become orthophoric and have really good BSV, actually, as long as we give them something like bifocal therapy. And then you've got your non ecoms and then the intermittent distance exos. These deviations are quite sort of common in children, but exos happen rare in comparison to the esos when, when children are young. With these deviations, it's about seeing the control. So if you're managing them in practice, it's like you're managing them to see how well they can control their deviation and then over time having a look to see if that control has been lost and then what are you going to do next. <coughs> so mechanical deviations generally to do with the muscle. A lot of these can be congenital, so Browns and Duanes. So Browns is a problem because the muscle is too small, so it's generally the superior oblique that's affected, or it's fibrose, or there's something that's happened to the, the, the superior oblique, in which case you get a problem when the eye's moving in or up. Then you have the Duanes, so the Duanes, again, problem with the muscle, and it's generally the lateral rectus, but we know that third nerve actually su supplies pretty much everything under the sun and so it tries to basically help out the, the sixth nerve that has been a bit damaged and not been produced as proper as it should be and so you start getting some medial rectus sort of abnormalities with the lateral rectus that's been affected as well so in Duane so along with that because the third nerve is also supplying the lid the pupil you actually find some aberrant regenerations with the lid actually the palpable fissures widening and narrowing at the same time. So it's a good differential to use with the Duanes. Then you come onto the blowout fracture. Blowout fracture, it's really important at this stage to take a good history because actually taking a good history will tell you a lot. So with a blowout fracture, you can have a problem with actually the infraorbital nerve because <coughs> obviously with a fracture, you find that the floor and the walls are generally the ones that are the, well, the floor first and generally then the medial wall is the one that's damaged. And that's when muscles can get trapped and the nerve can also get trapped. So at that point you start getting facial anesthesia. So doing simple tests, like differential tests, like you know, just touching the cheeks on either side and asking if the patient can feel it equally, etc. This is going to basically help you differentiate between a soft tissue injury, which actually might not need any management whatsoever, um, and might just need a little bit of sort of recovery time, and then once their bruising has subsided, subsided, you just see them again, and generally things should recover. Um, or you find that actually it really is a blood fracture and they have a problem where the nerve is trapped, in which case you need to try and release that. Um, so they would go into surgery quite urgently or there would be a different form of management. So it's really important to know um, exactly what's going on and take a good enough history to be able to establish. The last one, thyroid disease in a mechanical disorder, again, it affects the muscles, the muscles become enlarged, the globe is only so big and um, it affects the rectus muscles first. You find that actually the eye can prop toes and you have other factors involved in that. And the other factors involved, things like the cornea becoming quite dry, lid can't get over the eye itself. And it can actually cause some optic nerve problems as well. So again, doing relevant tests like um, colour vision can check, visual fields can check that these things are okay.